industry on parade. A pictorial review of events in business and industry produced each week by the National Association of Manufacturers. Out of one of the nation's 150 Portland cement plants rolls another load of one of the most vital building materials now urgently in demand. This plant, largest of the 150, is neither in Portland, Oregon, nor in Portland, Maine. It's the plant of the Huron Portland Cement Company, and it's in Alpena, Michigan, just about halfway in between. Cement plants are built near the sources of their raw materials, and this limestone quarry of the Wyandotte Chemicals Corporation provides Huron with one of the three or four basic ingredients of Portland cement. Other materials that go into Portland cement include silica, alumina, iron oxide, gypsum, and shale. In recent conservation experiments, the slag from blast furnaces has been found to be a suitable substitute for shale. The raw materials go first to the primary crushers, where the big boulders are knocked down to more convenient size. Eventually, before they leave the plant in the form of cement, the huge chunks of rock will be reduced to a powder that will pass through a sieve so fine it will hold water. From the primary crusher, skip cars haul the materials up to a conveyor belt that takes them on to other crushers and hammer mills. The conveyor that rolls endlessly toward the main plant is covered to prevent the wind from whipping crushed rock over the countryside. Control of dust is a problem the engineers of this vast establishment must work constantly to master. Moving along mechanically from one operation to the next, the raw materials are brought closer and closer to the form of powder. Finally, they're fed into a rotary kiln where they meet a roaring blast of flame with a temperature of more than 2,700 degrees Fahrenheit. Inside the slowly revolving kilns, certain elements are driven off, while the others, as they move from one end to the other, are fused into a new substance called clinker. After cooling, a new grinding is necessary, and the product that results is Portland cement. Into the holes of ships go thousands of tons of the powder daily, destined like as not for Portland, Maine or Portland, Oregon. For Portland cement was named not for any city, but for a certain stone it resembles, a stone to be found on the Isle of Portland off the British coast. Away goes another full cargo to meet a constantly increasing need for cement in the construction of homes, factories, highways, and nearly every other structure of peace or war. The pioneering days of perilous journeys in covered wagons have gone, but in their place have come exciting challenges of new and undreamed of scientific and industrial developments. Developments that demand imagination, skill, and purpose in the same way that the untamed wilderness demanded courage and stamina. These developments, the continuing wealth of new products, new processes, and new industries, are the direct result of our ability to keep our personal lives our institutions, and our whole business system free. The American way. Inside this vine-covered factory at Hagerstown, Maryland, the Brandt Cabinet Works, craftsmen go about their duties in what might be described as the labor of love. Take Randall Hawes. He's been doing expert cabinet work here for 45 years. What's more, Randall has three sons employed by Brandt, and they too have been here a long time. Harry, for example, here fashioning a tabletop, has been on the job for 28 years. John Hawes's service extends over 30 years. His dad made a satisfying career out of it, and so has John. And here's the third son, Arthur. 
He's been at Brandt only 20 years. You might say he hardly knows his way around, but he does know what goes under the table legs. Brandt's claim is that it makes furniture of quality, but it also makes something else, men of quality. For in addition to its many old timers, Brandt also employs a number of men who, though along in years, are just beginning their careers. Not pictured, but working here and there in the plant, are a few ex-convicts and some former heavy drinkers who have got back on their feet through Alcoholics Anonymous. They're all on an equal basis with this veteran employee, responsible citizens of the community, and they're responding in excellent fashion. A casual visitor to the plant couldn't possibly pick out the men who are getting that second chance, and one thing is certain, no one here will point them out for you. Whether they've been at Brands for 45 years or are just beginning to live anew, they're all craftsmen together, and all that matters is what kind of fellow worker you turn out to be. The National Plastic Products Company plant at Odenton, Maryland. A firm that plays one specialized part in the manufacture of a product that makes life a little easier and better for all of us. Arriving at the Odenton factory daily come tons of a white plastic powder called Saran, made from petroleum and brine pumped out of deep underground lakes in the south. The Dow Chemical Company produced the Saran powder. Now National Plastic Products will further process it add pigments, and extrude or spin it into a fiber that can be woven like cloth. Here, National Plastic Products will not do the weaving. It sticks to the job it does best, leaving earlier and later phases of the manufacturing operation to firms that have the expert know-how in those fields. Out of the extruders come heavy strands of plastic, which cooled in water and drawn out become thinner and thinner. Finally, the saran becomes a strong filament, 15 thousandths of an inch in diameter. It can now be handled in much the same manner as you would handle thread, but its color is built in, and it has uses to which thread could never be put. Now it moves on to another city in another state for the next step in its development. The Lumite Division of the Chicopee Manufacturing Corporation of Georgia is the company that finally transforms the saran into products that will be used by the consumers. First, some of the fiber is rewound onto bobbins that will shuttle back and forth in the weaving to make the cross strands. Other spools are put on a creel to be rewound onto much larger rolls. They'll feed the fibers that run longitudinally. Chicopee has had long experience as a manufacturer of cotton cloth, so the changeover to weaving plastic fabrics was accomplished with a minimum of confusion. About once every two days, the roll of saran thread for the warp must be renewed, and a mechanical tire joins every strand in only a few minutes. It's here, for example, that a company like Lumite is able to take advantage of knowledge gained in generations of practice in allied fields. Once everything is ready, the loom goes into action. And the end product, not cloth as you think of it in this case, although elsewhere in the plant, the plastic is woven into fabrics for a variety of uses. This is insect screen cloth with some surprising advantages over the usual screening materials. Completely rust and corrosion resistant, it requires no protective painting since its color is built in. Strong, light, and taut, the armed forces preferred it above all others during World War II, especially in the tropics. Now, even when used in areas right near the water, it's doing a standout job for the American homeowner. Around this particular household, where there also appears to be a shortage of manpower, it's Lumite screen cloth to the rescue. Inflation is not new. It has existed since ancient times and has hit nearly every country in the world. In America, we've experienced inflation for the past dozen years, 
Inflation caused by government debt and easy credit policies which cut the value of our dollar nearly in half. The way to stop inflation is to increase production, reduce government spending, curb private and public credit policies from making inflationary loans, and put the cost of government, including defense spending, on a pay-as-we-go basis by adopting a sound tax policy. We must lick inflation. What strange new product is being produced here? It's nothing stranger or newer than all-day suckers with a safety handle. We're in the Chicago plant of the Curtis Candy Company, where the job of making the suckers, candy bars, and other sweet tooth satisfiers is no longer one of back-breaking manual labor. Now, millions of pieces are produced each day, all uniform in taste and purity. Stirring used to be a real chore, as anyone who's cooked a batch of fudge can testify, but no longer. What looks like a weaving snake is really an endless roll of candy being squeezed smaller and smaller until it enters a shearing machine that transforms it into fruit drops. Wrapped in tin foil by machine, the packs get their bright paper wrappers in the same way. But skilled human hands are still best for putting the packs in boxes for even the best of machines cannot detect slight imperfections. But now we move on to the department where, from great tanks of chocolate, milk, and other nutritious farm products, the men and women of Curtis draw the materials for the firm's most famous item, the Baby Ruth Candy Bar. Here are formed, first of all, the fudge cores. Molds are powdered with cornstarch. Then in pours the fudge. After hardening overnight, the cores are ready for the next phase of the operation, which involves having a thick layer of freshly roasted peanuts pressed into them. Then it's right on into the machine where they're coated with rich milk chocolate. When the chocolates dry, the bars go into their wrappers in groups of 10, which makes for easier packaging. The wrappers then are sealed, again, 10 at a time. Once they're in their boxes, the bars must keep moving toward the consumer. For to make sure that its product will be fresh, Curtis, although it manufactures hundreds of thousands of pounds of candy each day, retains none of it in storage. It's a practice the customers seem to like. teamwork show up fake gems. Why would an association touch off an explosion? What good are crash programs to industrial groups? Industry on Parade. Peabody Award winner for public service, produced on film each week by the National Association of Manufacturers. housewife getting supper for her family? No, this is a experiment in a test kitchen high up in a Manhattan skyscraper. Kitchen research aimed at finding new ways to use a crop that's in oversupply. In this case, the tomato crop. The results of such research, carefully studied by a board of experts of the Can Manufacturers Institute, on behalf of its members and, of course, the consumer, are new exciting recipes involving the use of tomatoes whose increased consumption will be good for all concerned. Another research experiment, this one testing the strength of a TV screen at the underwriters' laboratories in Chicago. Here, every day, 
Products of all kinds are tortured under conditions far more severe than they'll ever encounter in actual use. Not only must the set function safely under normal conditions, but even when parts are disconnected, misplaced, or worn out. Heaters as well as TV sets, and that delicious stew we saw a moment ago, all are fair game for the countless experiments performed every day by industrial associations. This is a report on how and why it's done. Work undertaken by groups of companies for the mutual benefit of all their members and of the public they serve. Here, electrical cords are twisted and untwisted 3,000 times. And here, a roofing material is tested for fire resistance, one of some 400,000 products examined by the laboratories since their establishment by the National Board of Fire Underwriters, which still supports their fight against everyday hazards. The whole interior of this building at Norwood, Massachusetts is filled with flames purposely started by the engineering division of an association of mutual fire insurance companies specializing in the protection of industrial plants. Raging infernos like this one are part of the everyday routine at the factory mutual laboratories where experts constantly seek better ways to prevent big fire losses. That was an explosion of dust. Just one drum of gasoline can do this. To this laboratory, industries submit hundreds of samples for testing each year. Liquids, dusts, fibers, any substances suspected of being flammable. By analyzing them scrupulously, the experts learn how to store them safely, how to minimize accidents. In doing so, they have helped bring fire insurance costs down to their present low levels while helping maintain productivity and safety records that are the envy of the world. Most of the members of the Western Pine Association are companies too small to conduct extensive research individually. But working together, they've achieved some remarkable results, like the wood finish that swells up when a flame strikes it to provide its own protective insulation. When he cuts away the insulation, we see that the wood underneath has remained unaffected. Also developed here, an electric eye saw that snips out knots automatically. In a mill, there will be two blades a few inches apart. Scientific knowledge about the shrinkage characteristics of various woods is the subject of inquiry here in a project sponsored by the National Association of Furniture Manufacturers. It's part of the Wood Technology Laboratory of the University of Michigan. Want to find out just how strong a certain piece of wood may be? They're equipped to get the answer. To make better furniture, the experts have to know the points of greatest stress and strain. Electrode reactors tell them. Wood is scrutinized here in Appleton, Wisconsin, too, along with every other material, process, and technique used in the manufacture of paper. This scientist is trying to determine precisely how waste chemicals can be safely disposed of in a river for the benefit of the fish. Results are available to all firms supporting the Institute of Paper Chemistry, where 50 graduate scientists concentrate on experiments like those that have helped the paper industry achieve such remarkable advances over the years. How? Well, through experiments like this one, for example, involving a pliofilm tent in which samples are subjected to 85% humidity for long periods. The analysis that follows is a valuable aid in devising new products with greater resistance to moisture. Analysis can get pretty rough at times, as when the boxes from the humidity tent are placed in a big tumble tester. But it's torture with a purpose.
Eventually, the carton has to give way. The goal is to find out how to make it hold up as long as possible. Just one more example of the sort of scientific studies being financed by numerous industries to give us better products and better services at lower and lower cost. In Los Angeles, the Gemological Institute of America is another case in point. It was organized by the jewelry industry to help members with tricky problems, evaluating and identifying questionable stones, detecting frauds, recommending whether and how and where a gem should be sawed or cleaved. Experts from all over the world come here to improve their knowledge about gemstones and to study, in addition, the gem testing and diamond grading instruments developed by the Institute. By means of the Institute's equipment, our cameraman is able to obtain some striking close-ups of the interiors of gems, real and synthetic. This is an uncut diamond, 16 carats, octahedron in shape. Notice the inclusion, separate crystals that were formed when the diamond was being created. Now they're going to show us how a stone that looks like a large, beautiful emerald is proven to be a fake. First, it's checked on the refractometer, which reveals whether the stone bends light waves as a genuine stone would. But to really show it up, submerge the so-called emerald in liquid. And we find it was really made up of two colorless pieces of stone, joined by a colored cement that made it look deep green when viewed from above. Here's a sapphire. Is it natural or man-made? The unaided eye can't tell, but the curved growth lines reveal it to be synthetic. Man-made or not, it's still a spectacular gem, just so you know what you're getting and pay a fair price. Now, a natural sapphire. See how the growth lines are straight and formed in a hexagonal pattern? Finally, a diamond that looks like a real beauty until a closer look shows flaws. Here at the Institute, that closer look is always available for the protection of jewelers and their customers. More prosaic, but just as important to more people, is the work in progress at this research center. To the American Institute of Laundering here at Joliet, Illinois, come garments from all parts of the country for rigorous tests to determine their washability. First, each one is measured carefully so it can be checked later to determine shrinkage. Now the shirt will be washed three times in the Institute's model commercial laundry, which incidentally has helped develop the present high standards observed by the industry. For scientific accuracy, all fabrics of a particular type must be washed exactly alike. Same kind of soap, same amount, same water temperature, and so on. So widely admired are the facilities that the National Institute of Dry Cleaning also uses them to study the washability of new fabric finishes, which are applied and renewed by dry cleaners. Both before and after washing, fabrics are put through a variety of tests, like the one that determines bursting strength. Pressure builds up behind a rubber diaphragm until the cloth gives way. Swatches are tested for resistance to fading in sunlight by a device called the fadometer. 40 hours under the carbon arc light inside equal two years of sunlight. It's one of the many tests a fabric must pass before it gets the Institute's approval, one of the many ways in which research by industrial groups works to protect the American consumer. Among the most spectacular of the research projects backed by associations and their members are the grinding ordeals to which automobiles are subjected in the interest of improved safety.
specially built tracks and highways serve as laboratories for the scores of continuing experiments that have been supported over the years by the Automobile Manufacturers Association. For five consecutive years, the association's grants for such projects have topped one million dollars a year. Every scientifically arranged crack-up yields valuable information that may help save a life. From tests like this have come improved driver positioning, passenger protection, better brakes and glass. Released by a tow car traveling at high speed, an old model is purposely spun off the road to serve as a standard for gauging today's improvements. In the same way, they sacrifice newer cars in the search for even greater safety improvements ahead. Among the many organizations aided by the Auto Manufacturers Association, the Automotive Safety Foundation has received more than $10 million from the motor vehicle industry since 1937. Since that date, the nation's traffic fatality rate has been reduced by 60%, down from 15 deaths to less than six per 100 million miles. Yet another example of the great public benefits derived from groups of firms who pool their resources in research for the common good. American industry, builder of a better tomorrow, has presented Industry on Parade, a service of the National Association of Manufacturers. plane lands like an office chair. Why will this substance improve your kitchen? How can driving be improved by a pistol shot? What sort of game is this dog after? Industry on Parade, a brand new look at our America, produced on film each week by the National Association of Manufacturers. engineers of the Convair Division of General Dynamics Corporation in San Diego comes an order from the Navy. Build us a fighter plane that can operate from the deck of any ship. Here's their answer, the Pogo plane. If their plans work out, it will take off straight up and land in the same vertical position and yet fly horizontally at fighter plane speeds. The huge drafting and design departments take over from there. Three years and thousands of blueprints are devoted to working out all the infinite details. The prototype is constructed. Because no one has ever flown such a plane before, the Pogo is tested inside a hangar, suspended on cables running to the ceiling and to the floor. Now it's time for the real thing, take off test flight and landing. They check and recheck every last working part. The pilot will take off lying on his back. Three years work and a man's life are at stake, not to mention the role this craft could play in guarding the nation's security. Power is supplied by turboprop rather than straight jet engines. That's because counter-rotating propellers will give better control in those vertical takeoffs and landings. The test pilot is Skeets Coleman. Looks like a foolhardy profession, flying revolutionary new planes like this for the first time. But Skeets has full confidence in the experts who designed it and put it together. On starting, the engines get an assist from a compressor on the ground. The engines are really jet engines, but instead of pushing the plane like a rocket, the power they generate is used to turn the props. Everything is working smoothly, and Skeets is about to take her up.
at less than 200 feet, he levels off to assume horizontal flight. These are the fellows who said it could be done, how right they were. After level flight at speeds above 500 miles an hour, the plane noses up, hovers like a hummingbird, and gently lowers itself to the ground. As one humorist at Convair put it, this plane lands like an office chair. There's a tiny landing circle marked out on the runway, and Skeets maneuvers the plane to set it right down on the mark. Not only the Navy, but the Air Force too, and even the Army, are now interested in the amazing plane that can take off or land anywhere and does away with the need for airports. America's new frontiers are pushed back every day somewhere in this country through research. Each year, industry spends two and a half billion dollars in research to discover new products or improve those already on the market. These new and improved products mean better and less expensive things for all of us. But more important, they mean more and better jobs with an ever greater chance for better living for everybody. This can happen only in America, where industry is free to experiment, where men know they can refuse to accept limitation, where we have a competitive enterprise system in which nothing is impossible. A young lady whose hobby is ceramics is about to give us a demonstration of a material essential to many branches of industry and essential to many of the products we get from industry. Not the clay out of which she has made this artistic casting, but the glazing compound with which she is now coating it. The heat of her home-sized kill will fire the compound and transform it into an attractive, durable, glossy surface like that on her chinaware, sinks, bathtub, tile walls, range, and refrigerator. Twelve hours later, the glazing is complete. So now, let's go to Baltimore and look in on a plant from which comes the glazing compound she used. Here at the Pemco Corporation, we learn that glaze is used in the making of dinnerware and tile, like the porcelain enamel used on the other industrial products we mentioned, are basically glass, that is, silicon or sand but they contain a lot of other chemicals as well to help them perform special functions like bonding to various metals, resisting high heat and sudden cold, remaining impervious to acids, and so on. The formula is prepared according to the way the batch will be used, the color required, and other considerations. Then the chemicals are carefully weighed out in accordance with a specific recipe of the ceramic engineers and are thoroughly mixed so that all parts of the resulting batch will be uniform throughout. Now the raw materials are melted at about 2200 degrees Fahrenheit. The molten glaze pours from the lip of the smelter and immediately drops between two rollers which are cooled by water flowing inside them. This converts the semi-liquid mass into thin, brittle flakes called frit. Immediately, the flakes are broken up into tiny pieces. The shade of the frit has little to do with what it will look like when it shows up finally in the kitchen, bathroom, or as the outer surface of a building. For in the firing that follows the application of porcelain enamel, a delicate green can change to a light pink, or a light pink might become a deep maroon. Here is a clear glaze coming out of the smelter. Glazes for dinnerware or tile are quenched directly in water. As it hits the water, it crystallizes into particles about the size of rock salt. Before it can be used, it must be dried and then milled to much smaller sizes. Drying is accomplished in gas-fired rotary dryers like this. Here's what it looks like inside. 
Finally, the frit is shipped out to factories in every part of the country. And from those factories, in a few weeks, it will find its way into our homes as the beautifying and protecting surface of some valuable piece of equipment. Here's a problem in traffic safety, being discussed by driving instructor Leonard McKellar of Portland. Where and how to make a right-hand turn? Sounds like the simplest thing in the world for any experienced driver, but experienced drivers are by no means necessarily safe drivers. Leonard travels all through the West as safety supervisor for Pacific Telephone and Telegraph Company, lecturing to and testing the driving practices of employees who use company vehicles. Here's one of the tests. These tumblers must remain standing while the car is brought to a smooth stop precisely on an indicated line. Good one. Now the parking test, which is standard in most states' driver exams, but which is judged much more stringently by Mr. McKellar. He takes off points if you so much as touch bumpers with the car ahead or behind. Begun just three years ago, this program has cut the accident rate of company drivers 40%. Some of the tests have powerful educational value. For example, here we find McKellar about to test a man's reaction time. See how long it takes him to respond to danger. At 20 miles an hour, McKellar pulls a string and fires a capsule of paint onto the pavement. When the brake is hit, another shell fires more paint. While the driver was reacting, the car traveled 17 feet 5 inches. After that, it took 16 more feet to stop. Total distance at 20 miles an hour, 33 feet 5 inches. And this is much better than average. Brand new Americans are arriving at a record rate. About 7,000 citizens are added to our population every 24 hours. By 1975, it is estimated we'll have a population of some 220 million persons. These new Americans will need a great many things from babyhood to voting age. Businessmen are planning today for the 10 to 15 million new families we'll have in 1975. It's up to every one of us to help maintain a strong and vigorous enterprise system if we are to fulfill the needs and desires of an ever-growing America. A car full of hunters arrives at Nilo Farms in southern Illinois. Thereafter, both duck and pheasant, and have they come to the right place. Of course, Mr. John M. Olin, the host on today's trip, is well aware of that fact, for he is chairman of the board of Olin Matheson Chemical Corporation, which runs Nilo Farms as a demonstration for farmers and sportsmen of something called controlled shooting. There are kennels on the farm, housing some of the finest retrieving dogs anywhere. Also, hundreds of pheasants reared in pens to help replace the millions of game birds exterminated by intensive farming methods that utilize all the land and leave the birds no foraging or nesting areas. Here at Nilo, another sort of farming, strip farming, is practiced, and farmers come from miles around to see how it works. The idea is to leave patches of submarginal land on which the birds can find food and cover. In many cases, this is land not profitably cultivated anyhow. In others, it is land the farmer purposely seeds with the sort of plants that will make it good hunting territory once his other crops have been harvested. Come autumn, he can add to his income by charging hunters a fee because they know the birds are there and because hunting conditions are ideal, birds and hunters all have a fair chance. Use of good retrieving dogs is encouraged to eliminate the chance of wounded birds not being recovered. Flying cripples their call. When the party turns to duck hunting, we see what kind of retrievers these dogs really are. That water's near freezing, but in he goes. You may wonder why a chemical company would be spending money trying to persuade farmers to develop controlled shooting. Part of the reason is that one division of Olin Matheson manufactures firearms and ammunition. 
and maintaining the supply of game is a form of business insurance. But just as important, John Olin is a sportsman, and he plans to do everything he can to head off the threatened elimination of many of our finest game birds.